Mike, is a ground rod and a metal pole necessary to protect the luminaire from lightning? Well, you know what? Let's do some background. Ready for this? Number one, Article 100. Make sure you have your code book. Get your highlighter. Guess what? My tabs are no longer in the plastic container. So we're getting closer. There, just saying. Okay, Article 1 on the definition of the term ground. The earth. So please, if you ever at any of my seminars, or if you ever hear me say the word ground, I'm only talking about the earth. That means that if you ever say the word ground, you're only talking about the earth. So, looks to me like you got some problems. Because, well, Mike, how are you going to ground that receptacle? Well, that would be a stupid way to say something. Well, i got to make sure I, I ground this and I do this. Like, unless you're planning on taking it to the dirt, don't use the word ground, okay? So, we'll talk about when we will. We've done, been talking about this for a while. Ready, go? Okay. Effective ground fault current path. That's a term that's defined in Article 100 as well. Now, the effective ground fault current path is an intentional path created to provide a low impedance path from the point of a ground fault back over to the source and it's for the purpose of clearing a fault. See, when you have a ground fault that's defined in Article 100, when you have a ground fault, that fault current is returning to the power supply, which is going to be the transformer at some point, either utility transformer or if you had installed a transformer to the secondary of that transformer. So that's what the fault current is going to. And if you have a low impedance path from the point of the ground fault to the source, what do you think is going to happen to the current? I is equal to E over R, right? E, electromotive force. We use the word voltage to measure that. I is equal to E, the voltage over R, the resistance. It's really the impedance which gets AC circuits. And that's when we get into theory. We talk about what resistance is and what impedance is and reactance and, and those kind of things. So now, if you have a low impedance path, effective ground fault current path, what happens? You trip the breaker. So let's take a look at this. If you have a light pole, but listen, if you have anything wired with electricity, I don't care what it is, you have to have an effective ground fault current path from that enclosure that contains those conductors. So if we have a light pole, you're running circuit conductors out there, you have to bring an effective ground fault current path to the pole. And we call that an equipment grounding conductor. And if you go to Article 100 and you defeat and you read the definition of an equipment grounding conductor, Eric Stromberg, my buddy who's on our video team, got that definition revised. And we've talked about that in the past. It is part of that ground fault current path. It's part of the effective ground fault current path. So here we go. We'll bring a circuit out to the light pole or anything. You have an equipment grounding conductor in the event of a ground fault. Fault current hits that pole. It travels on the equipment grounding conductor back over to the effective ground fault current path. Open the breaker. Nothing is near a problem. Now, the earth, the dirt itself, just dirt. Go outside, pick up some dirt. Look at that dirt. That's not an effective ground fault current path. That's not intentionally constructed by you. It's not a low impedance path back to the source. So we can never use the dirt to clear a fault. Okay. Now, the code allows you in 250.54 to add, to install a supplemental electrode. I mean, I'm sorry, to install an auxiliary electrode. I've seen people put auxiliary electrodes next to motors. Oh, you're going to see some other, there's some other things. I can't remember where I was, I just saw something, somebody just drove a ground rod next to it. Oh, people put ground rods in pools, around pools, like, come on. But the code says, listen, if you want to add an auxiliary electrode, 250.54, you can. You know what it also says? There are no rules. Why no rules? Well, because if you don't need to do something, and the code says you can do it, if you don't need to do it, then there's no rules to follow because you don't need to do it. And the code tells, says this about this electrode. It says, you don't have to bond it in accordance with 250.50 of bonding all electrodes together. Number two, it says that it doesn't matter what the resistance is of that electrode. So it could be 1,000 ohms or 100 ohms. As a matter of fact, you could, you could drive a 16 penny nail if you want to, to make your electrode. You can take that 8 foot ground rod or 10 foot ground rod, cut it in third, cut it in half. It doesn't matter. You can just take the wire if you want to, just stick it in the dirt. 
And not only that, but the code doesn't care what size wire you run to the auxiliary electrode. This is all covered in 250-54. So we don't care what size wire, don't care whether the electrode is there, don't care what the resistance of the electrode is when it contacts to the earth, and don't, and it doesn't have to be bonded to anything. So you have to have a rule covering something that you don't have to do. And you're like, why would you have a rule covering something you have to do telling you you don't have to do anything? Because there's people out there thinking you have to do something. So you have to have a rule telling you, listen, you don't have to do anything, okay? You shouldn't even put it in there, by the way. You should never put an electrode that's not required by the code, ever. That's another discussion. Okay. If you drive a ground rod, and let's say that ground rod was 25 ohms, that's the contact resistance. The earth, when I measure ground resistance, I'm measuring the contact resistance of that ground rod to the earth. Let's say if it was 25 ohms. It might be, it might not be. If it was 25 ohms, ohms law. So what? how many amps would travel, leave the source, travel to the metal pole, energize the metal pole, go to the ground rod, and then travel in the dirt and find a path getting back over the source? If that resistance right here was 25 ohms, well, Ohm's law shows you I equal to E over R, 4.8 amps, right? Guess what? It's not tripping a breaker. It's okay because it's not supposed to trip a breaker. What's not okay is thinking that you can use the earth as an effective ground fault current path. If you're driving ground rods because you're worried about something, then you're probably screwing it up because you don't know about the effective ground fault current path. Okay, let's take a look at this light pole. By the way, it was a practice for a long time to not bring an equipment grounding conductor out to light poles, traffic signals and what have you. Well, if you don't bring an equipment grounding conductor out there, guys were driving ground rods because they thought it needed to be grounded, but they brought no equipment grounding conductor. You're never gonna clear a fault. And then look what happens here. Here is a grounding, an auxiliary electrode with no effective ground fault current path, no equipment grounding conductor. There's a ground fault, energized everything. You're going to have current traveling through the ground rod, and you're going to have additional current traveling to the individual, and they can get easily killed by touching the pole. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk about that tonight. A young boy playing football gets killed by touching a pole, and there was a ground rod at that pole. I hope tonight's video you will learn something, and you'll be making the world a little safer. And by the way, this is a true story. Male dogs, they have a tendency to kind of, you know, lift up the leg and pee on a pole. Yeah, they've gotten killed before. I don't know about a female dog, but I do know male dogs have got killed. Okay. Um, oh, gosh. Brian, I wanted to show a video, uh, and I, I apologize. I don't think they can see the video from my computer. Can they see a video from my computer? Probably not. Okay, so, Brian, um, see before we end up here, if we can get this video here about the heat pump with no effective ground fault current path. We'll see if we can play that in there. All right. So, let's just get back over here to this graphic here. If, no, if there's no equipment grounding conductor, there's a ground fault. We talked about the current traveling through the ground rod of about 4.8 amps. If there were 25 ohms, just using an example, which you're not realizing there's going to be a voltage gradient all around that. Guess what? Grounding does not bring anything to a zero potential at all when it comes to ground fault. You're going to have now the earth of voltage gradient, and that could be a potential problem. All right. This young boy, this Georgia boy dies. He is in, this is, I forgot, uh, Augusta, Georgia. I think it was in Augusta, Georgia, yeah. This young boy right here, he jumps on the fence and he gets killed. Guess what? There was a wire nut in the, inside that, the metal pole structure. It heated up, it melted. It made contact with the metal enclosure. It energized the enclosure and guess what? That pole was actually Right there's a ground rod, and there's the acorn fitting right there. So that pole was grounded. And you know what's interesting about this case? I was involved in this case, but I, I gave it to a buddy of mine to manage because we don't need to get involved in that case. Is that ground rod and that, you see that ground, that, by the way, this is called an auxiliary, an electrode. Not required by the code, doesn't really matter, doesn't serve a purpose at all. But people do it because they think it's a good idea. And they had no equipment grounding conductor in the circuit. There was a ground fault. Pole became energized. And guess what? 25 years earlier, I think it was 20 years earlier than that, the same thing happened to this exact pole. There was a fault in this exact pole. And a woman got shot, sued the city, got money. And guess what the city did? They came back here and they ran a new wire 
and it put a new ground rod. And then 20 years later, this young boy right there dies. Listen, guys, I need you to know what you're doing. You really need to learn electrical theory. You have to have a copy of your code book. You need to, if nothing else, the worst case scenario, you need to get my grounding and bonding book and you need to get the DVDs. You need to not put yourself in a scenario where, listen, you don't want to know that, you know, you did something like this here. You thought you did a good job and you found out you killed somebody. How are you going to live that with that the rest of your life? This is important. Let's keep going. I can get going. You know, I get going. Okay. Now, this is in Miami, and I was driving by, and I saw these guys driving ground rods with a sledgehammer, you know, with a, with a ground rod driver, and this guy's, oh, this, listen, these guys got this thing worked out. This is a system here. This is actually in Coral Gables, down in the South Florida area, and Coral Gables implies what it is. It's just a coral rock area, and so driving a ground rod there is, is pretty difficult, if not almost impossible, okay? So why are they driving ground rods? You know why? Because the specs show it. An inspector might come out and say, hey, listen, I don't see a ground right at your pole. So they might even, you might even think you should be putting one there because you've been doing that. You've been told you've been doing that. No. How about this one here? I think Eric Stromberg gave me this one here. Here's a portable generator. And somebody thinks, well, you got to ground the generator. And somebody then takes a five-gallon bucket, puts some dirt in there, and they get, I don't know, three-foot piece, four-foot, maybe it's a four-foot piece, piece of ground rod with a, with a wire in there, and they connect it over probably somewhere to the frame of this generator here. Guys, please, please. How about this? The solar guys, man, they drive me nuts. Solar people, listen, guys, you know you're a little different. First of all, there's a couple of reasons solar people are different. Man, to understand electricity backwards, say we're working off AC and we go power going to loads, where solar guys are going from, they're working backwards. You know, they're actually having power instead of being a load, they're going the other, and it's not, it's not AC, it's DC. So we're getting. You're getting power being generated in DC, then you're converting it with an inverter and taking it over to AC and the code rules in 690 and 691 and 705 and 706 and 710. Let me tell you something. If you know solar and you really know what you're doing, you get your code book, which not many people really do. Get my solar book here. That is one tough shop subject. You gotta be a smart, smart person to really design solar, to install solar, to inspect solar. It's complicated. But even those smart guys, guess what they think? Look right here, the defense. A ground rod. The solar guys want to see the fence connected to a ground rod. And I'm thinking, the fence is already in the ground. I don't know if they know that, if they even thought about that. And what the heck would you drive a ground rod and connect it to some wire along the fence? What is that all about? Because it isn't going to make a difference. The fence is already in the ground. If the fence became energized because um, it's likely to become energized, we talked about that before, right? The term likely to become energized, that it has to be connected to an equipment grounding conductor. Well, a ground rod is not going to happen. Okay. Okay. Uh, Brian, um, we're still getting to the question about Mike. Is the ground right at the bottom of a pole? Sorry, I have to go this way. Is the ground right at the bottom of a pole intended, maybe, okay, maybe not to clear a fall, maybe not to get a zero reference, none of those stuff, but is it there to maybe protect the light fixture? Code calls it a luminaire. Brian, are you ready to go ahead and play that video? All right, let's play that video. I love this video. I wish I could watch okay, it. Let's again. review this. The effective Brian. ground pole current path, in this case, is called the equipment grounding conductor. That if we, when we had it connected, Oh, remember, and we made this connection here. Ball current traveled along the effective ground pole current path back to utility, tripped that breaker, a little bit of spark, not much. I've lost the effective ground pole current path. And what's very common in street lighting and uh, parking lot lighting and ball field lighting is they will not bring an effective ground pole current path there. The practice, just the way we've done it for 100 years, they've run the phase conductors, which is your, your hot wires, and then they take a wire and they go over to a ground rod. That's what killed that one boy. You saw the one with the fence? Yes. Well, that's what they did. And 25 years ago, they had the same ground rod and they almost killed the girl. She sued them. They said they fixed it. All they did was they cleaned the connection of the ground rod. 
and they left the ground rod there, and then 25 years later, a boy playing football gets to the fence and the pole and gets killed. So now let's see what happens. If you have something that's metal without an effective ground ball current path, and you run a wire over to a ground rod, okay, Dave, you turn it on? It's on. Okay, and we turn it on, we'll find out how many amps it's gonna take. That's a 50 amp breaker. Carl, how many amps is that drawing? 0.28. 0.28. Think about this, Carl. We had a conductive wire, copper or aluminum, running all the way back, all the way to the transformer. That was the effective ground fault current. Properly installed, properly terminated, right? Does that, it'll clear it. You really think the dirt is gonna be a conductor? Because look at it. It was less than one amp. Now we can, but now watch what happens. Not only do you have this problem, but you have a ground rod over there, you have a piece of electronic equipment, you have a ground rod over here at the service, lightning strikes the field, it creates a voltage gradient, now the electricity will come up that ground rod through the wire that you installed, connect to the equipment over here, going back to the other ground and destroy your equipment. One of the reasons why you never want to drive a ground rod to any piece of equipment. Now let's see what happens though. They lost or they did not have an effective ground fault current path. They thought, no worries, we'll drive a ground rod. We come over here, we know the current was less than an amp. So that's definitely not gonna trip a 50 amp breaker. Now look what how it happens over here. Here's the ground rod. Brian has created an amazing set of meters here that from this point here to this point right here, I'm standing right now, that is 113 volts. That's what it is, it's 113 volts. If I go here, it's 115, over here is 116. So there is a voltage in a circle around here going all the way out. So not only did we not clear a fault, but now we created a scenario that we created a much greater area where you can get killed. See, if they brought no effective ground fault current path and they didn't ground it, you can only get killed where? Say where could you again. get killed? If you touched it. Because if that was energized and no effective ground fault current path and you don't clear it, right? Which it is. Which it is. And if you touch that, you're going to get killed. But now that they ran a ground, we increased the area. Okay, so we see that grounding equipment and not providing an effective ground fault current path is not gonna clear the fault. Yes, you do have some current traveling, and yes, you do have a voltage gradient, so you've expanded the area to kill somebody. You never ever drive a ground rod except where it's required by the National Dakota. You always bring an effective ground fault current path to every piece of metal that's connected to equipment. Now, as you'll see when we get our slides, some of the deaths occur because the wiring itself was pulled out of the connector and the wiring was the effective ground fault current path. Happened to a young man in Iraq. He was taking a shower. He got killed because the wiring from the generator, military guy, that came to the building, there was a, the outside sheath, sheath was metal, but when they put it in the connector, it didn't, the metal didn't make contact. So there was no effective ground fault current path. There was a fault in the plumbing pump motor. So every time they turn on the water, it ended up energizing the water piping system and he got killed because there was no effective ground fault current path. The young boy got killed on the pole because he touched the pole or he was in a voltage gradient because they grounded it, purposely grounded it. They purposely did not bring an effective ground fault current path because they thought grounding would make it safe. You okay with that, guys? All right, let's go back into the class and uh, let's take a look at some more stuff. Right. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and the picture. Ready? Okay, so you watched that video and we talked about why the young boy got killed, right? And we talked about the people driving ground rods. They must be doing it for a reason. And we talked about kind of crazy concepts of grounding. And we talked about the fence that people put ground rods in fences. Listen, it's not illegal to drive ground rods where the code doesn't require it. It's just not a good practice because it does give the false impression of safety. Like that young boy that got killed. Those people, by the way, Pretty much all um, ball field lighting probably has no equipment grounding conductor and probably has ground rods to it. So don't be touching ball field lighting. 
All right, so there's that voltage gradient that was explained a little bit in the, in the video. Of course, we covered this in many different places, particularly in our bonding and grounding class, you know, in video. We really covered it in more detail. I got to go quickly, so I apologize. If you don't understand, I, I can't answer some of these questions quickly. All right, so Brian, would you play this? We're down to, okay, but what about the ground rod at the lightning pole? There had to be a reason, Mike, somewhere somebody did something. It does it protect the light picture. So can you show us this video on the lightning so people can understand the concept? the coolest video of all time what you really need to do to be honest with you is you got to go frame by frame particularly in the slow motion because when you see the lightning strike you probably didn't catch it but if you watch it again you'll see that there's parts of the roof itself metal parts of the roof itself is arcing because as the lightning is going down it's called inductive induction it's inducing all kinds of voltage on all the metal parts so there's purposes for grounding but it's it's, it's not for this reason here. So back to the question. Well, Mike, doesn't a ground out of pole serve something? Okay, Brian, can they see this image here? Okay, let's just imagine somewhere down here, there is a light pole and it has a light picture on top of it. And there is this lightning bolt that comes down that you saw what it does to a friggin' tree, <laughs> cuts it in half, and drops everything in there. Who knows what it did inside the house, in the building, as it decided collapsing on top of that electrically. Do you really think a ground rod at the bottom of a pole is going to protect that, protect that cute little LED fixture on the top of the pole? Come on, guys. Okay, Mike, we didn't have LED fixtures before. Okay, HID fixtures, high-pressure sodium fixtures. Do you really think? Of course not. People were driving ground rods because they thought that's what made it safe from electricity because it was grounded. Grounding doesn't make anything safe. Bonding, as a matter of fact, if you notice my book, my book is the only book that's titled Bonding and Grounding. Every other book is titled Grounding and Bonding because the most important thing we have to do is what? Bonding. Now, there is grounding requirements in the code, and you, should need, you need to know those, and we've covered those many, many times already. All right, so no, no. How about this one? I found this, I don't know, 100-something foot tall pole with light fixtures all on the top of that. What? 12 inch and a quarter bolts, anchors that go down maybe 18 feet into this massive concrete base. And look at this. There's this cute little ground wire. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you got this thing bolted down with 12 inch and a quarter bolts and you seriously think there's gonna be a design specification and it's going to show a ground rod or some kind of grounding scheme on the bottom of this pole. Oh my God. Guys, do you understand why I go crazy sometimes? This is why I go crazy. Because I know theory. <laughs> this is like a lot of people don't understand theory. That's not, and the code, the code says you don't need to do this. You need to bring what? An effective ground fault current path. Okay. Now, I got this comment from, we covered this a little bit a week or so ago, a couple weeks ago. Whether it's good or bad, Mike. Contractors are responsible for building the project per the drawings and specifications. I would caution electricians not to make the decision not to drive a ground rod on their own as it will end up in contractual problems later. Let's hope these rods go away in the future. I forgot the name of the gentleman. He's 100% right. That's right? so what shows on plants. That's what you got to put it in there. One day, these dinosaur engineers that are showing all these, or the designers that are showing all these ground rods aside here, Hopefully the younger guys are going to watch my videos. They're going to say, hey, you know, and they're going to become the boss one day. And they're going to say, you know how we can save some money in this job? How about we get rid of all these crazy ground rods around here?